You're listening to a Youth Takeover edition of the Remaking Tomorrow podcast, where teens host the program and welcome peer guests. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Remaking Tomorrow, a series of conversations about the future of learning, of teaching, of being. I'm Xander, I'm 17, and I'm a rising senior, and I live in Oakmont, and I'm here with my co-host. Hi, I'm Amanti, I'm also a rising senior, and I live in Toronto, PA. This podcast is powered by Remake Learning, a network that ignites engaging, relevant, and equitable learning practices in support of young people navigating rapid social and technological change. On today's episode, we'll be talking with two youth guests about how students should be supported as they learn both today and in the future. To start, let's meet our guests. I'm Corinne, I'm a rising senior, and I live in Ben Avon Heights. I'm Sam, I'm a rising senior, and I live in Upper St. Clair. So today we will be talking about how we learn best, the places, the methods most conducive for learning. Without going into too much detail to start, what methods works best for you all? For example, lectures, discussions, hands-on, taking notes, drawings, and etc. Mine would be hands-on or like if I'm listening to music or like if something's in an audio form, I tend to like grasp and understand it more. I'll be able to like remember it later. Uh, I'm a visual learner. I like to see things laid out in diagrams and show how the ideas are connected. For me, I'm definitely hands-on in a visual, but I can learn in other ways. Me being a visual learner and also a hands-on learner, taking notes is really helpful for me because I can remember and recall where I put a specific note and go back to that. So when I was younger, I couldn't stop drawing on my arm, and all the teachers would think I'm distracted or, like, they'll yell at me because, oh, you're not doing your work. But then they noticed that every time I would draw on my arm, I'd actually be acing the tests I took that week. And the days that they'd stop me, I'd probably miss something and I'd fail. And my mom, she's like, I'd come home, there's ink all over me, so she would get really mad. And then she just bought me, like, these pens that were, like, you, you can write on yourself with these pens. Like, they're safe ink pens. And my teachers allowed it, and I gradually started to pass stuff from there. Somehow it just helped me fidgeting without, you know, causing too much of a distraction. I think we all have that one thing that helps us. Mm -hmm. For me, I like twiddle my pen. I'll, like, tap on the desk. Yeah, I'll tap on my desk, too. So another question for you guys. What is the pros and cons of the learning methods that you guys described? I talked about how I like things laid out in diagrams, but that doesn't always work for every subject. So... Sometimes I have to use different methods for different subjects. Yeah, sometimes I'm not able to have it in music form. Like, I know when we were young, younger, you'd have, like, those conjunction song or, like... Conjunction, you know, junction, yeah, that what's one. that function? Exactly. You hear oh, it, and I, used to love I that. still remember that to this day because, you know, it's in music form. I, I yeah. can <laughs> recall it. So sometimes it's not available or the teachers are just, like, they don't care enough to put it into a song form, so I don't really get the most of it. So that's kind of the con Mm -hmm. for me. Going back to what you were saying about the songs, I think that definitely helps younger learners grasp something because it sticks with them a lot easier. Mm -hmm. So they're just singing it randomly and they don't know when they're going to take the test. And it's just like, hey, I know that word. Conjunction, you know, and it's just like they start (laughs) singing and then so it helps them. So, yeah. Did anyone else for their multiplication tables, did they have like certain songs like like for multiplications of seven, at least in my school, it was like the happy birthday song. It was like seven, fourteen, twenty one, twenty eight, thirty five, and like continuous. Oh no, actually I never, You've never did had that, that? No, that actually I'm Is gonna, that just my school? I'm gonna be honest, I still don't know my multiplication. <laughs> <laughs> but like there was like different ones and it just helped like at least me like grasp that. So mm-hmm. I think me, like putting things in the music form. But I also think adding on to when it comes to music, do you guys focus better when you're listening to music when you're like doing independent work? It depends on the kind of music I'm exactly, listening to yeah. because I would imagine you guys know what lo-fi is. I'm sorry. That's lo-fi. I, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, lo-fi is a big thing that got popular, especially over COVID, I think, because we were all just trying to relax our minds, focus on getting our schoolwork done. And lo-fi is a very chill type of beat that you can listen to and concentrate a lot easier. R&B works for me. Like, I can't listen to punk music when I'm <laughs> trying to mm-hmm. study. That just doesn't work for me. I'd say, like, a Mac Miller, almost, yeah. like, a, like, mm-hmm. chiller. I can't listen to, like, Lil Baby when I'm trying to study because I'll start rapping, yeah. and then I'll yeah. start Once getting it into it. Yeah, yeah so, <laughs> yeah, so that's another thing, uh, the type of music you're listening to. When you guys struggle to learn something, what really does help you? Like, uh, do you guys tend to reach out? Do you guys tend to keep it to yourself and try to teach yourself? Do you guys ask your parents? Do you guys go to teachers? Do you guys go to, like, who would you go to, almost, is the question. 
I have a problem with asking for help. I mean, I know I should go and ask for help. And Xander knows I don't really get embarrassed of things I do. No. Like, I, I do a lot of crazy stuff. I don't get embarrassed of it. But when it comes to, like, asking for help when I genuinely you need, need it, help, yeah. I can't bring myself to do it, and it just doesn't work for me. So a funny story along with that. So I was actually really struggling with chemistry, and my teacher got super mad at me and thought I was joking around whenever I was asking for help. I was like, I can genuinely not understand this. And I had to transfer my class because she, like, she threatened me with detention. So I switched my class. I ended up doing pretty well in it. It was like the remediation version of chemistry. But I'm like, if this teacher's not going to teach me, like, what other choice do I got? Right. Yeah. At my school, we have these uh, programs for people that have ADHD or, like, different... Like an IEP? Yeah, I, it was that, yeah. So we actually get a certain level of help, but the thing is that with our school, the help isn't much help. It's, yeah. like, more just... Giving you answers, almost. Yeah, it's either you get the answers flat out, boom, you don't really learn anything, or they're just like, you do it on your own, you should know this. If I need help, like, I'm not afraid to ask for it, but it depends on the teacher. Yeah, I usually look it up on the internet and go on YouTube and watch some sort of video, like a crash course video or something that lays it out in, like, visual images, because that works for me. Khan Academy videos. Yes, Khan Academy. That was, like, my whole history class this year. If you were in charge of teaching kids, what would you guys do? I'd make it a little bit more activity-based. Yeah, I know at a young age, kids are very impressionable about what they do and not really some, like, they can be about what they hear, but uh, more getting them to get active and, like, step out of their comfort zone at a, at a younger age. Yeah. And, like, getting them outside, doing some fun activities, not making everything too related to school, but keeping that school mm-hmm. aspect inside of it. For, like, an example, I would say, like, if you're teaching a science class and, like, you're talking about, like, photosynthesis. Mm-hmm. And you would take them outside and like kind of describe to them with like a physical flower that's planted into the ground or yeah. a tree or like whatever it is, and like how like the water system works and that kind of stuff. That's just a science example. Yeah. Like it's hard to do with certain classes like history. Like you can't mm-hmm. be like, oh, let's take the time machine and go back to 1862 <laughs> or whatever it is. I think that would engage more students as well. Going out like and, of your way to make sure they understand and just showing them. Yeah, like, a, a real life example. Yeah, and if you related it to someone or something in their life and then they looked at that and they saw that again, they would kind of remember the lesson. Having a more accepting space for kids to be themselves and for everyone to feel more comfortable in their own skin and not be judged by everything they do because in high school, that tends to happen a lot. People judge a book by its cover and I know we've all heard the saying, don't do it, but we all do it. And just creating a more accepting environment for kids to just be themselves is something that I would probably enforce. What solutions would you suggest talking to kids younger than you about learning? There's a lot of like technology out right now that help little kids learn and like develop their minds. And my cousin, my little cousin, he's like insanely smart at his age. And it's crazy because like, you know, I was not even nearly as smart as he was at his age. And that's because like all he does is like play these fun learning computer games. Games, yeah. Exactly. How old is he? He's seven. My little cousin, uh, he's three or four, and he knows everything about space. He names all the planets. I'm like, I couldn't tell you all the planets on the Earth right now at 17. Yes. It's the same thing with Mike. He's he's an animal person, so, like, his show was Wild Kratts, and he would just go off. Yeah. And uh, so I would say, like, just don't hold back. Don't stop what you're doing, love to learn, you know, just like enjoy learning and keep it fun. Stay in the moment. Yeah, like Mm -hmm. don't rush out of it to do something else, just enjoy it. What you were saying, keep learning fun, I feel like, I wouldn't say that's not on the child, but it should be on the adults and the people Mm -hmm. around them to keep in mind, to um, keep learning fun for the kid. If I'm going to suggest something for them, this is kind of probably for teachers too, but to offer a bunch of different assignments that cater to different types of learning, teachers should do that so that kids have the opportunity to figure out how they learn. Because if I knew before now, I've only more recently figured out how I learn best. And if I knew that beforehand, school would have been so much easier. What different things would you have kids learn at school and community centers or even at home? 
definitely more about themselves. You're always like taught to like learn math, learn science, learn English, learn you know all that stuff, but no one really focuses on your mental well-being. Like it's till it's too late when to there's a problem, and they should really focus on you at a younger age to help you find your space where you don't have a problem. Yeah, like find yourself and just genuinely care about like your well-being and teach kids to care about themselves and others. I think that in schools and like community centers and even like at home too, adults can teach kids how to interact with other people in a positive way. That's what I was thinking. We all had that kid when he was little that like was just really annoying and he would like come back at you and come back at you. That was me. Yeah. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So if you got taught how to treat people in like the right way, I feel like people now still need to be taught how to treat people in Mm -hmm. like a positive manner. Yeah, I feel like even since we're entering such an age where technology is so involved in our lives and we're not always talking one-on-one with someone, communication skills would be really important to learn. Cyberbullying also. I would, That's a huge problem. Yeah, soft skills are very important, especially listening to someone. If mm-hmm. you're having a conversation, you have to listen to what they're saying to have a reasonable thing to say back. You know? yeah. If something in education seems to be working now, how would you keep it going? I would say listening to, like, the students more than teachers are because I feel like they don't really take the students' opinion into consideration most of the time. If they, you know, take the time out of their day to, like, really ask the students and gather up survey maybe of uh, how everyone's feeling, how everyone's feeling about the subject, and, like, collecting, like, a large pool of those results will tell you this is a good thing, more students are learning from this than not, or this is a bad thing, everybody hates this, we should stop doing it. Some teachers have certain schedules. They have schedules for like months in advance. But what if someone doesn't understand? What if a kid doesn't understand? They're just left in the dust. What if they miss a day? They're they're back. They're like, oh, I can only meet with you this day and this day. What if I got practice? Yeah. What if I got a family obligation? Mm -hmm. What if I got something? What if I got work? Like, what am I supposed to do? Just sit there and be like, oh, I guess I'll go online and look it up, even though this is your job to teach me and make time. I think they should slow things down. Say they have a first period class, a fifth period class, and a sixth period class. If their first period of class is way ahead, I would say slow it down a little bit and try to catch everyone to like a certain spot yeah. mm-hmm. at a, a reasonable manner. You can't be like, my fifth period class is like two days behind. Let's throw all that information out there today and get them caught up. They mm-hmm. need to like still sectionally teach it. But if one class is excelling, I think, I guess, calm it down. Yeah, yeah. I, know I what would you're say if the class is behind and this is to the teachers, don't stress the students out about trying to speed up the learning or just try to like get on the same page as the other students. But it's not the same group of students, and you can't compare one class to the other class because they're not the same kids. They don't learn the same. They don't think the same. They don't talk the same. They don't have the same households. They don't have the same minds. Maybe teachers could provide optional non-graded practice activities and put that out there for students in case they are a little lost with something they'll have the opportunity to do that but not feel forced to do it when you do something on your own you feel better about it than when you're getting forced to do it like i I can read on my own but when a teacher tells me i have to read something i'm like okay well i don't want to read i don't yeah i don't want to (laughs) or like when you go home it's like kind of off topic but like when you go home you do the dishes, you know, it's okay. But, like, when your mom says do the dishes, you're like, oh, I don't want to do the dishes now. Yeah. Like, yeah. And it gives you some responsibility yeah. over your own schoolwork. If something in education seems to not work out now, what can the teacher change to make it work for you? Sometimes I feel like teachers have certain attitudes about what they're teaching. Like, they might say, oh, this sucks, but we have to learn it. But I feel like maybe they should try and keep a more positive attitude because – we probably don't want to learn it to begin with, and then if they feel negative, yeah, if they feel like, oh, this is useless, you don't want to learn oh, like, why the heck am I paying attention? <laughs> yeah. Like, why yeah. would I ever do that? Yeah, the teachers that more show love for what they do and passion, I think you learn a lot more from that class because you see, it's like, hey, they really must like this. Maybe I can like it too, and then you kind of go out of your way, and maybe you don't like science. Maybe you're uh, an art person, or yeah, maybe you're like an English person, and you're like. I could always try this. Like, I could learn something new in science. Like, you know, you, can you teach me that? That seems very interesting. Yeah. I've never thought about it. So I've actually had a teacher. It was my eighth grade math teacher, and she was literally like a mother to me. And yeah. mm-hmm. she would well, I'd come that. in, 
and she'd call me her son. It was like a, it was a really like a, funny it, thing. It, exactly. Yeah. It was like a, a connection that we just had. She would come to my football games, even when they're like out of state. Like I remember we had a game in Ohio and she made the trip to come to like our football game in Ohio. And through all these years, most of the days she'll email me and say, oh, how you doing? Uh, you Aww. doing good in math? So she'd like check up on me now and again. Now at math, I'm still not the best, but it's not as bad because you have that exactly. relationship with your like, teacher. I come to find it somewhat enjoyable. enjoyable. Exactly. Say you love something all throughout your school years, and right when you hit high school, you have a really bad math teacher. Say you used to oh. love math, mm -mm. used to have a strong passion for math, and you come to high school and you have that one teacher who just hates their job. They act like they don't want to be there every day. They act like they don't care. They're just like handing you things and not actually teaching you. That can also be a detriment to your learning in math and kind of hold you back from wanting to learn more or even staying focused in their class. Whenever you're saying like when teachers are active, if they're energetic about what they like and what they do, it makes it so much more enjoyable. They're like jumping all over the place and like want to teach this to you. I used to have a very, 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 and notice I said very a lot, <laughs> very energetic chemistry teacher who at Eight in the morning would come to school just full of life and full of excitement. And we were all just sitting there like, I don't want to be here, but you kind of are starting my day. So, I mean, it's okay. Like, he would start the day every morning with a joke. And even if we weren't in the mood and even if we act like it wasn't funny, which it wasn't. It was very corny. We would just be like hey, you forgot the joke this morning. He'd be like, oh, so you guys do like them. We're like, eh. <laughs> but no, it, it definitely does help. Even if we're not showing it, I think the teachers should still be consistent with that because you never know. Being a kid at heart is another thing. I know if my teacher were to put marshmallows and toothpicks in front of me in geometry class and have us build like a pyramid that would stand up because we had to learn about triangles and different shapes and all that kind of stuff. I'd be like, this is a kid activity. I don't want to do this. But secretly, I'd be like, this is really fun. I'm actually enjoying this. And I feel like a kid right now, which is another thing. Like we miss our childhood. I think all of us can agree that we yeah. miss our childhood. And so just like having some time to be a kid, it's just fun. But on the contrary to that, yeah, we are kids at heart, but teachers, when they try to overcompensate for that, they tend to baby us. And it's like, oh, I'm yeah. a kid at heart, not a baby at heart. Yeah. yeah. And when they start to baby us to the point where it starts getting annoying, yeah. that's when you really start to disconnect. And that's when you're just like, okay, well. Whatever. Yeah, exactly. Like, I'm not going to deal with this anymore. It's like that happy medium. And I think experience plays a big role in a, in a teacher. Mm-hmm. I've definitely had teachers that have had certain attitudes about their classes. I remember I had this one class, honestly it might have been sixth grade math, and he would just sit there and he would give us a workbook and we would just learn the math on our own and do That's whatever we did and that all. was the class. We just did all of it from this one workbook and I hated that, like that was terrible. And I don't even like workbooks anymore now for all other classes, like that I kind of ruined workbooks, workbooks for mm -hmm. me. The trauma. So as a final thought, what are one or two things you think are going to be essential to support kids when they learn in the future? Uh, the programs that they have in place, like the ALS, like Assisted Learning Support, like that program is very helpful. That was very helpful for me. I think like throwing things into songs, like mm -hmm. we said earlier, the conjunction yeah. junction and the multiplication tables, yeah. throwing a song like to help. Boost, exactly. Yeah. You'll just be, yeah, like Amati said, you'll just be singing it out of random. You'll be like, wait, I know that. Whenever I hear a conjunction, I promise you that song is uh -huh. still in my head yep. from like second grade. I think different learning style activities or even just different options. I like that. That would be mm -hmm. helpful. And like I said earlier, more comfortable environment for kids to be themselves. A more accepting place. What is one thing that parents and educators can do to make tomorrow a more promising place for every learner? Getting rid of like the thought of this wasn't how it was when I was growing up. I hated uh, that. Like, I yeah. hated that. When I was that. younger, my mom would be like, oh, you don't have enough homework tonight. I didn't, I had so much homework. And I'm like, okay, well, this I don't have so much This isn't how they taught me homework. when I was a kid. Exactly. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, oh, it's like just... some sort of guilt tripping. Exactly. Like, you have no control over that. What are you supposed to, you're supposed to just feel bad about that? It's like, yeah, mom, you had to like walk to the library and like, study for this test and read all these books. I'm like, yo, I don't got to do that. It's just, you know, 
answering four questions, maybe. You know, that might be the yeah. homework. Those questions could still be challenging. It's yeah. still helping me learn. It's not the end of the world if I don't have homework, you know? Yeah. And just, like, getting rid of that stigma around modern-day assignments or modern-day ways of teaching. This Youth Takeover edition of the Remaking Tomorrow podcast is a collaboration of Remake Learning, Knowledge Works, and SLB Radio Productions. Opinions solely reflect those of the individual speaking. For more details, visit remakelearning.org.